Hello, everyone. On behalf of Vivi, I'm so happy to welcome you here today. I'm Christy Pinero, and I'm the Director of Campus Operations at Vivi. And I'm so excited to be here with you with our expert, Dr. Stephanie Wagner. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about something that is on everybody's mind, and that is, is my child typical? As a parent of two young children, I find myself asking this question daily. And I know I'm not alone. Uh, from speech delays to potty training to tantrums and more, I know we're all just trying to figure out what we should do to support our children and if they even need support. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by Stephanie Wagner, clinical assistant professor and licensed psychologist in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU Langone Health. She's also the director of early childhood uh, clinical services there. So as you can imagine, she has a ton of experience working with children and families, and she's an incredible resource that's going to be able to address some of your most pressing questions about social, emotional, developmental development in young children. If you're not already familiar with Vivi, I'll give you a quick overview of what, what we do. Vivi is on a mission to reinvent childcare and early learning in today's families. We currently have seven campuses in and around New York City, including a brand new campus in Westchester and they specialize in early learning and care for children ages six weeks to five years old. We also partner with employers of all sizes to bring childcare and early learning to their working parents as a benefit. And we truly believe it's our mission to support the whole family, not just with high quality learning and care, but also with the education and resources for those early years, which is why we're actually hosting this conversation today. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few program logistics and then we'll go ahead and dive in. First, I just want to thank you. I know everybody is so busy and you have so many things to do, and we are just grateful that you were able to carve out some time today to join us. So thank you. We have about 45 minutes together. I'll use the first 30 minutes to run through some thoughtful strategies and tips with Stephanie, and then we'll go through some of your questions. The chat function is open, so feel free to drop your questions at any time during the webinar, and we will do our best to get to all of them. Finally, I just want to acknowledge that child development is a huge topic, and there's no way that we're going to cover it all in 45 minutes, but I promise you that you will walk away with one practical, applicable tool that will help you feel more equipped in whatever is coming your way. With that, let's go ahead and dig in. Stephanie, I'd love for you to give an overview for everyone of what they can expect from our conversation today, and then share a little bit about what we mean when we talk about the word typical. Awesome. Thanks for the wonderful intro, Christine, or Christy. You um, I, you know, this topic is really near and dear to my heart as an early childhood psychologist. I get asked this question or a variation of this question a whole lot. It usually is one of the first questions parents ask when they call my office. Um, and, you know, as a mother of two young kids also in the zero to five age range, I feel really fortunate to have such useful knowledge to guide how I think about my kids and my parenting. So my goal here today is to help you start thinking about this question, how to answer it, and how to take some preliminary steps to address things if you find out, oh, this might be less common for my child's age and certain characteristics. So, you know, parents and parenting young kids has a lot of questions, right? Should my child still be anxious around new people? Should there be this many big emotions now? Um, all kids don't really pay attention or listen to instructions, right? And so the idea here is to think through if those things are coming up in your family or will be, how would you go about answering it, thinking about it in a way that's not alarmist and helps you with a concrete plan? So when we're asking this question, is this typical? It really means a whole bunch of other things. This means like, well, given my child's only a certain age, is this expected or not, right? Like my child is a toddler. They should be constantly moving, right? Or can I do nothing? Will my child grow out of this without any support and we're just in this phase right now? Should I be concerned? What and can I should be doing about this? And this is really hard to answer. We're going to talk about why this is so hard to answer and how to start thinking about it in a way that's similar to experts in child development and psychologists. So the early childhood years are a really amazing time. It's a incredible, unique period in development children's brains are forming more connections compared to any other stage in life. 
And so they are learning a number of tasks, including cognitive, language, motor, social, academic skills. And that all results in a number of developmental stressors. It also makes it hard to tease out what should be happening when, especially because not all change happens in steps or in stages or in a linear directional way. And there's a range in which skills develop. So a child may have really strong motor skills, um, but they be more average or low average in language or in um, kind of social skills. So that makes it tricky too, in terms of figuring out, well, what should I expect at any given time point? When we think about kind of development and the common challenges and the myriad of developmental tasks that occur each period, each are really complicated and each developmental task really require kids to integrate many developmental skills. So some of the major tasks at this time are developing these really strong bonds and attachment with primary caregivers and other secondary caregivers, figuring out language and figuring out language to communicate wants, desires, needs, um, developing that autonomy. And with that comes tasks like toilet training, trying new foods, refusing foods, um, figuring out when they can resist, how to resist, and then integrating that with caregiver limits and learning about what happens what. And given all of these things that are changing so quickly, bumps along the way are bound to happen. They're inevitable. Like how could they not happen with so many things changing seemingly overnight? So kind of thinking about whether it's a bump or more um, challenge that needs some help, this idea of like, well, what's transient and what's some of the common challenges? So some of the common challenges that really emerge are um, children figure out their wills and their voices, and they're going to figure out their autonomy and try to push back on limits. There's going to be some limit testing and not listening. As children are figuring out they're their own person, and they may not have the language to fully express things and their thinking skills are still a work in progress, you're going to see more of those big feelings, big emotions or tantrums. There's challenges with focus and sitting still, especially during the toddler years where they're really driven to explore and figure out their environment and that doesn't isn't conducive to sitting in one spot. Um, and then there's a lot of life events and life skills that happen, right? So most kids in this age range start childcare. Um, many start at Vivi or other childcare centers. Um, so they're figuring out how to separate from parents either for childcare or for a nanny or for a sitter. And then oftentimes there's new family members. I know in the audience, some of you have siblings or have another one on the way, which is really exciting and also a big adjustment for families. And so figuring out, well, what's expected given these environmental changes and what's not really becomes difficult to tease out. And that's where parents are left kind of trying to ask that question and wonder. Hey, Stephanie, um, I want to just jump in here and ask a quick question, if you don't mind. I think it's really hard. I found myself doing this when I had my first child and then with my second, right? Just trying to figure out actually what is typical, right? And so you might be a first time parent, might be your first child, you might only have one you know, sibling to compare them to. Um, so could you talk a little bit about why this can be so challenging and then maybe dig into some behavioral examples about what is typical or not? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really challenging because as parents, you see kids in certain contexts, usually the home environment, um, where it can be very different than other environments where kids spend a lot of their time. Um, and there may or may not be other same aged kids around. And the settings where you see other kids around may not give you a good picture of what that child's like all the time. So you don't have that frame of reference. So, you know, you hear things like, oh, the twos are hard, right? Like it even comes with that reputation, that terrible twos, right? Which personally I don't like because of the negative connotation and it's really an amazing time and a challenging time. Um, but this idea that the twos are hard, so you expect it to be hard. So you don't necessarily know, well, when is it too hard, right? Like, yeah, my there's having some meltdowns because the food's not in the on the right plate or not cut right 
yeah, that's typical, right? And it can be. Um, and there can be a point where it's happening at a greater frequency and intensity and causing more problems in the parent-child relationship and stress in parenting that make it something that would be less common and need more support. And it's, I think parents, especially first-time parents, have trouble making that distinction. It can be really hard. Um, the other thing that can make it really hard is even for families that maybe have several kids, kids are different, right? You know, and you hear that from parents all the time when they have several, like, oh, my first is like this, but my second, you know, like they're the active one or like, you know, this one's the easygoing one, right? Like parents tend to label their kids as a way to help explain and understand them. And so sometimes it's hard to know, is it just because these siblings are a little different or is it something more than that? Um, and I think that becomes problematic too, right? Because then it's like, you're comparing one to one, but you're not taking that broad like view that we would be taking on a population level of like, does this stand out? And even more so than does this stand out, is this something that's causing some problems in functioning? You know, and that as a psychologist is what I'm concerned about. Is this like creating some, some need for us to fix this because it's preventing the child in some way from some of these developmental tasks they should be doing, like making friends. Um, the other piece I think that can be really hard is sometimes it can be attributable to life stressors, right? So thinking about life stressors, right? Like a new sibling, a move, a change in schools. So feeling like, oh, well, maybe these are, would be the expected changes in response to that. And maybe yes, maybe so. So sometimes that alters the lens in different ways. Um, and then I think one of the areas that I often see as, as a psychologist is parents who come to me and saying like, well, my child's fine at home. They have some trouble in childcare. The, you know, the teachers have shared this with me. Um, I don't know what to make of it. They're not like that at all at home. And I think, you know, there it can be really hard, especially if that's not what you see in your child or what feels normal or typical to you. Um, the child care setting is a really unique one because you see a range of kids in, at the same age or at similar ages going through a structured day together. And I, I think that gives a really different lens and really valuable information. And there's some differences between a child care setting and a home setting and sometimes that leads to seeing things sooner than you might in a home setting where things like aren't as challenging or aren't as hard. There can be more flexibility. Um, so those were great questions. So thinking about some specific areas, you know, that parents often ask about one is tantrums or big emotions. And I personally, you know, don't love the term tantrums. It's still referred to that in the research, but thinking of it as more as like these big feelings or big emotions that kids are having trouble controlling. When we think about big emotions, it's really because self-regulation is hard and self-regulation requires a lot of brain development and little kids, their brains are still developing. And so it's very much a work in progress for kids to understand what a feeling is and something that they feel strongly in their body, and then figuring out how to manage it. And this is one of the most common things that comes up with parents when they're talking to um, other parents, when they're talking to pediatricians, and when they're talking to people, it's, it's a common behavioral concern. So some of the things that are more typical with a, with a big emotion or big feeling would be some whining and complaining, some protesting, potentially as kids get older, right, and more sophisticated, they start talking back. And for really young kids, you know, in that toddler period, it's really common that they struggle to manage those feelings when their goal is blocked, so they're not getting what they want, when there's some sort of conflict, right? This could be like someone in childcare grabs the toy they want, or a sibling takes the toy they want. It could be when like, you know, whatever food or the food or the way it's prepared is put out is not what they want, even though they told you it was right. Like those are the kind of things that can get those typical big feelings. Um, some of the things that are less common for big feelings and big emotions are older children, right? So if they're persisting at a big frequency after age four, usually they've subsided and, and peaked before then. Um, also, if they're occurring multiple times a day as kids get older, that's a definitely something that comes less common. And if it's 
longer in duration. So the average time for like a big feeling or big emotion is just really brief, several minutes. So if it's taking longer than several minutes to resolve, it starts to be something that like, okay, this is becoming less common and less expected. Um, if it's frequently happening when it's really out of proportion to what the circumstances are, and that again is the intensity of it and how long it's lasting, and, and if it's challenging for the parents to manage, right? And it's consistently hard for the parents to manage. Um, another sign could be any hitting, kicking, biting, holding breath, um, throwing objects. That also takes it in the realm of less typical. Um, in thinking about fears and worries, which is another common thing in early childhood, because Kids in early childhood are learning who they are, who their caregivers are, that their caregiver exists even when they're not there, right? This is a major developmental task of infancy. Um, and then learning like that they always have their caregiver there and learning to trust them. Um, so along this time, some common fears and worries that are really typical are separation anxiety and stranger anxiety or shyness. And those tend to emerge in infancy. And they tend to peak early into the toddler years. Um, and then they tend to kind of really dissipate in that period so that you're not going to see as much of those after age three. That is preschool, which is also the early childhood years. You tend to start to see more fears and worries that are centered around their vivid imaginations, right? Because preschoolers have the best imaginations and are all about playing pretend. Um, so starting to see being fearful of imaginary creatures, animals, nightmares, um, the dark, because what could be in the dark, and then things that seem scary in terms of like thunder, lightning, and different elements outside. Um, when we think overall about fears and worries, the content, what's typical, but then what's typical and how they're expressed, um, it would be not uncommon for a child in the early childhood years to have occasional nightmares, right? That disrupt sleep. And that can happen when maybe there's more stress or anxiety, maybe there's a big transition, um, but more common and frequent nightmares that does get out of the realm of typical. Um, Age-related um, increases in separation distress. We expect toddlers that are separating for the first time to childcare to have trouble separating and to cry. And that's very different handing over a toddler to a teacher for the first time than handing over, you know, a four week old or a five week old, um, where that's gonna be really different or even, you know, four month old. Um, so we see that separation anxiety tends to kind of peak during the toddler years and that children in general, when they go to school for the first time, it, during early childhood preschool years and beyond, there can be some separation anxiety if that's their ex first experience separating. And we expect that to be temporary. And then you also would expect that if there is something stressful going on in the family or some sort of stressor, that you might see more clinging, reassurance seeking, that you might see things. And that could be related to illness in the family, a death in the family, seeing a scary movie, something scary happening in the world that they know about. But you may see this temporary peak. It's less common if fears and worries really persist for several months at a time. And then if that's combined with physical complaints, right? So stomach aches, headaches, um, being tired, that you're you're seeing that confluence there. Also, if the child just can't participate in age-appropriate activities due to worries, right? So often during the early childhood years, you're putting kids in maybe soccer or swimming or different events for the first time. And if you're finding that like their fears and their anxiety about it is holding them back, that starts to become less typical too. Um, we can also see in early childhood things where families have to make what's called a lot of accommodations to help their child, right? So that might be like only one parent can drop the child off or um, that, you know, kind of like um, a parent makes sure they're always home at bedtime because they were 
require a certain parent to go to sleep um, or a child needs things done in a certain way. And so the parent makes sure they're done in a certain way. We start seeing these like accommodations come up um, because parents are trying to reduce distress. And if there's lots of accommodations, that also becomes a bit of a concern because you're modifying things that you want your child to be able to do on your own. Um, so I, I don't know. If, Stephanie, yeah. can I jump in? Um, so even as a parent myself, I'm hearing the word less common, right? And it's it's making me my blood pressure a little bit higher and maybe some other folks on this call. And so, you know, knowing that maybe something we thought was typical and now we're hearing is less common, um, you know, what do we do with that information? What would be the next step um, that we should take? feeling that maybe something is less common with our child. Yeah. So I would say you don't need to be an alarmist and you don't need to panic. <laughs> oh my gosh, like what's wrong with my child? Like there, you know, um, there's something major or anything like that. It is time to think about some steps you can do to try to understand it better and figure out if you need to support your child in a different way. Um, and the good news is there's a lot of things that you can do and start doing on your own. And then there's the idea of like when and how you might seek support if needed. Um, so really the first step is doing some detective work. So trying to figure out some things about what's going on on your own. Um, and this is kind of careful monitoring and looking for patterns, looking for motives. And I'll, I'll break that down for you. Um, you're gonna use that information because there's ways that you can reduce problems before they even start and prevention. And prevention is an amazing set of strategies that can really make a difference for families. Um, there's also what I'd call the vitamin for social emotional development, um, which is a daily dose of a really structured special playtime um, that is really good for a whole range of problems. And then there's this time where you're gonna say, you know what, like I've tried some things, I'm still finding parenting stressful, or um, I'm still seeing my child struggle here. I want to seek out guidance. And how do you seek out the right guidance from professionals so you're on the right track? Um, so I'll break all of those down for you. Um, so the idea of detective work to understand better, it, for some of you with babies, you may be familiar with like the baby tracking, right? Like, oh, I'm going to keep track of when I fed the baby so I know when the next feeding might be or when they woke up so I can figure out about when to put them down next, right? And there's different apps you can do. I don't know if Huckleberry is still uh, common, but there's like Huckleberry, baby sleep tracker, a bunch of them. Um, and this idea that like, you're getting information, you're using individualized information about your child to figure out a plan. Um, this is kind of the same thing. You could also think of it as if you went to your child's pediatrician because your child has stomach aches, your doctor might want to know when did it start? How long has it lasted? Does anything make it worse? Um, how bad is the pain? Um, is anything else going on, right? So like this detective work is really important. And with behavioral concerns and social emotional concerns, it can be hard to just know that because what stands out tends to be the worst situations or like what's most recent where all of our memories are a little biased. And so without careful tracking, you may miss some important pieces. Um, so one way to track is this ABC system, um, which you're looking at a specific behavior. It could be big feelings or tantrums. And you're looking at each time it happens, how long did it last? How intense was it, right? Like, did, was there any throwing? Was there any hitting or aggression? Um, how much out of control did my child seem? Um, and then you're looking at what happened immediately before the behavior and what happened immediately following the behavior. So here you might be looking at who was involved when, when the big feeling started. What was the activity, right? what time of day, location, all of those details, and then how did others respond to the child and what happened to the child? And from that, you can get some really good information about why something's occurring, right? So um, for instance, like a child having some big feelings um, late in the evening when they're told to start their bedtime routine, maybe they're told to like, it's time to put on pajamas. Um, and they're having these big emotions and then kind of the parent spends a lot of time soothing them and comforting them um, and ends up kind of delaying bedtime. Sometimes functionally what's happening there is 
the big feelings is getting to delay some transition that the child doesn't want to do can can serve the purpose of getting extra comfort and attention and also can be something that like um is predict is potentially predictable right like you're knowing when it's going to happen and knowing the details and that type of information can let you know what type of strategies might what I want to put or where do I want to focus my efforts so if you saw this pattern like this is happening more often than not in the evening okay you can start to think about what could I do to prevent it and get ahead of it and and prevention is really really important um I like these pictures as examples. Um, and Ben Franklin's quote is great too. This idea, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And this is this idea that um, these are big messes to clean up, right? Like a toddler spilling paint everywhere. Like that looks like a nightmare to me in terms of like a lot of time, effort, and potentially money to get the blue paint up. I don't know if any of you saw this um, this because this went on like the talk shows and I think some of the the social media um these girls that wanted to look like Anna and Elsa from Frozen this was several years ago during the pandemic and they got into their younger siblings um diaper rash cream and put it all over their faces and hair and that's also something right that's like gonna require a lot of effort to clean up and it's the same for things like tantrums anxiety um, not listening, resisting routines, that when you're in the moment trying to manage a situation, it's hard. You might not know what to do, what you might be trying different things. It may take a lot of work to help your child calm down after or get through that moment. And so if you're thinking ahead and thinking preventatively, you might be able to do some things to prevent it, right? So for these situations, there might have been some preventative strategies that would have saved these parents time and headache and potentially money cleaning it up. And I do think there was like a recipe for how to get the um, diaper rush cream out of the hair, but I don't think it was straightforward or easy if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so prevention strategies are really great. You can think of this as if you were going on a long road trip or airplane ride with your child and you didn't bring anything for them to do, that is a recipe for a really rough trip, right? So like you wouldn't go on a long airplane ride just saying like, I'm gonna wing it and see how this goes. Your child would be picking the seat in front of you. They might be talking too loudly. They might be whining that they're bored. They might be trying to get up and climb over the people next to them. So there'd be a whole host of things that could go wrong and that when kids don't have something to do, they tend to find something to don't. So parents, are pretty good at bringing preventative type strategies for places like airplanes, right? So snacks, water, potentially some tablets if families do screen time. They might be bringing books, toys, right? They may have a whole arsenal of activities. A lot of times parents might make like a goodie bag or like a backpack of stuff um, in preparation. Um, that is an example of a prevention strategy. There's a number of other amazing prevention strategies. One is this idea of behavior proofing the environment, right? So this would be the example for the um, pictures on the last slide of like, all right, putting the paint on a high shelf out of the way or putting it in a locked cabinet. So doing something to change the environment. Um, this can be helpful if you're noticing either power struggles or tantrums around ch um, children trying to access things they're not supposed to, right? It's kind of similar to what you would do with a toddler where you're like, I don't want them to get hurt and I don't want them to get into anything dangerous, um, but you'd be doing this more for points of struggle, right? So putting the snacks that you want to be in charge of when they get snack and, and um, what they're offered, putting those on a higher shelf, right? It would be an example of this. Um, and you only know what you need to behavior proof from the tracking. The other would be trying to avoid some situations. So if your child tends to get overstimulated in really big, loud, crowded places, maybe going to an indoor play space on a rainy Saturday where there's a ton of birthday parties isn't necessarily setting them up for success. I see avoiding situations as kind of a short-term one because oftentimes parents want their kids to experience those things and you want kids to be able to, to be in a range of environments. So that's kind of the short-term one while skills are in progress. 
There's also the simplifying and making tasks easier. So, you know, hearing a lot like, oh, my child has a lot of meltdowns in grocery stores. So I don't bring my child to grocery stores, um, which, you know, kind of is one way you avoid the situation. Another prevention strategy people can do is just make a task really easier. Like we're not going for a whole shop or all the errands. We're going to go in and get one thing. So my child has a chance to be in practice, but I'm not putting on too much of a demand, right? So like, how do we make situations or tasks a little bit easier for kids? Um, Another really big one, because toddlers are all about being independent, is offering options, right? And that's a common one, right? Do you want your banana whole or do you want it sliced, right? And to try to get ahead of some of the particular preferences that especially the toddlers have. And then another big one is, is shifting the schedule. So shifting the schedule might be thinking about like, hmm, this doesn't work so well to, you know, kind of have this as our last step in the, the bedtime routine. Um, they really resist, they get revved up. Um, but maybe if I make toothbrushing earlier in the routine, they're motivated because stories and snuggles come next, right? So, and routines tend to work best when you do harder before the easier, because then it naturally has this built-in motivator of something the child's looking forward to. And that it tends to be easier than having them stop something really fun to do something less fun. So sometimes shifting the schedule or just shifting the schedule because you're realizing, hey, this is too late in the day for the task, right? So kind of, again, using that ABC information you have about when things happen and what's going on to think about little changes you can make. The other thing that I really like for a whole range of social emotional concerns is special time, which is really a daily dose of structured playtime. It's used in a number of therapies. It's evidence-based um, and it's really protected time to see kids at their best and see caregivers at their best and build and strengthen relationships. It's part of evidence-based for a number of child difficulties, including helping kids be more cooperative with their parents and, and listen better. It's good because it helps kids develop more confidence and self-esteem. So that tends to be really helpful for kids that are a little more inhibited or anxious. It also can be amazing for kids that have more big feelings and need more help with um, emotion regulation. And it's a good chance to model practice and encourage the social skills you want to see. So it's it's one of my favorite things to recommend because it is so universal and can help in so many ways. So in thinking about how to, um, and there's great information in kind of pop culture and in kind of some different media about this. I think NPR had an article in the last year talking about how to set this up. Um, but the idea here is letting the child lead. If you think about it, most of our days are centered around adults and centered around like getting kids on adult schedule, whether it's like out the door to sleep, um, to school. A lot of it is centered around like kids having to do things that they're not naturally inclined to do at a time where they're really driven for independence. So here, what we would have parents do is just follow along with their child, do what the child's doing, and try to take the demands away, right? So trying to avoid telling the child what to do, um, offering ideas and suggestions about how to play, um, asking questions that demand responses and demand that the child think and talk in a way that the parent wants to. And then there's a whole set of skills from parent-child interaction therapy called the pride skills that are a good way to encourage the behaviors you wanna see more and facilitate more neutral and positive child behavior. So some of the specific skills here, and these are things you can absolutely do with your child and, and, sh and should do if you have some concerns about things being less common and want to take some immediate action. Um, one would be praise. Um, and that's usually a skill that parents are really familiar with. We want this to be labeled praise where you're complimenting a really specific behavior, like really good job sticking with it. Um, I like how calm you're playing. Um, that was so creative the way you built that tower, 
I like that you found a solution and made it more stable, right? Like really thinking about those skills, those social emotional skills you want to bring up, build up, looking for it in play, complementing it. And we know that's one great way to boost a behavior is to give it that encouragement. R is for reflect. Reflect is repeating or um paraphrasing what your child says. This really lets your child be the driver of the conversation. It's good in very young kids because it helps with conversational skills. It helps model language development. Um, it helps reinforce speech. Um, but if a child says something like, oh, um, I'm building a tower, a parent might just say a tower or your tower is blue and green. Um, so it might be expanding on it or just saying back. And again, that's really good um, for speech and language and that good vocabulary input because the more that a parent talks and the more words a parent uses, the better the child's vocabulary is going to be. Um, imitating is a parent following along with the child and doing what the child does at their level. This is really good because this is how kids learn to play with others through parallel play and side-by-side -side play. And so by doing this, parents are doing what they want their child to do. And we know children learn a lot through modeling and watching others. This D is for describe. Describe is describing behavior or a behavior description. And this is just where you're saying actively what a child is doing. So you're adding another block to your tower up and now you made the door to the tower. Um, and you can think of it as almost sports commenting where you're trying to kind of talk about what's going on and narrate. That's good for attention, focus, for self-talk, which kids are developing at this age, right? And learning to like kind of stick with something and internally know what they're doing and know what they're going to do next. It helps slow them down, especially for those active little ones. And then enjoy is just that warmth that's so important in bonding in early childhood and the, the relationships in terms of using smiles and using enthusiasm to show you're having a good time. Um, some tips for one-on-one -on -one time. I think this is one of those things that's just so hard to fit in in today's world because everyone's so structured and trying to fit everything in. Think of it as quality, not quantity. So just a short burst of time every day five minutes is going to be enough to make some change as long as it's high quality. So not trying to say like, oh, I'm going to take you on a special outing to the park or to um, get a treat. Those are really nice to do too. They're not sustainable on the day-to-day -day basis. So just this really burst of play is scheduled and make it part of the routine, right? Um, we don't neglect things like toothbrushing, which are good to prevent cavities, thinking of this as preventing some social emotional difficulties and being kind of just as important as toothbrushing and meals and other things. And that five minutes is just part of it. Um, having it, being unplugged during this time, this do not disturb, putting screens in focus mode, shutting things off, realizing that we're always multitasking and there's a time and place to say like, this is the only thing I'm focusing on right now. I am in the moment. I'm really on it. And then setting up the space for success. So putting out toys that are good for child-led play, putting away things that are going to be um, too messy, putting on things that are going to be, you know, kind of maybe too rough, outdoor toys that should be outdoors and not indoors, screens that wouldn't lend itself to play in that way. So kind of having some things out almost creates this invitation to play, this like, okay, you can just get in and join. Um, in thinking hey, Stephanie, about, yeah. Stephanie, I have another question for you. Um, you know, what happens if a family child needs support, right? It sounds like it's really, it could be really challenging to navigate um, because there's a lot of resources out there. So where, what would your recommendation be on where to start? Yeah, so I, I think it is hard, right? Because it's hard to know where and it's hard to know who. I think a good first place is to um, kind of know when you're going to seek it out, right? Like, what are the signs? And again, I know we're getting towards the end, but I think the impairment or like the problems in day-to-day -day functioning is really important, right? So if a child is having trouble with making those initial friends or those initial play skills, that parenting feels stressful, that daycare 
has concerns, you know, and obviously sometimes those can be saying specific. Oftentimes, though, they do see a wider range of, of kids. So if your kid is in a high quality daycare, you're, you know, they have this important lens that they've seen a lot of kids and they see them in comparison. And if you're feeling like I've tried a lot of things, I'm throwing things at the wall and they're not sticking. So in, ter in terms of seeking out support, I think the most important things are like, a lot of parents are like, maybe I should wait and see, like, maybe it'll get better. And I tend to be at the mindset of like, the sooner the better, because all these things are emerging at this age. And if you will need less effort now to get things back on track. So you starting earlier makes more sense than like, oh, is it still ongoing at seven or eight? It's going to be a more long course and potentially more complicated course of figuring out the supports. Um, and more time that, you know, your child's missing out on relationships or experiences or different things. Um, but some general thoughts about seeking out support are, you know, kind of getting some guidance from trusted people like daycares often and schools and child care centers often have um, ideas of who's been effective, who's worked with other children. Um, pediatricians can be a great resource, too. Um, the other piece that that is really good is just knowing, right, like what to be looking for. And it, with early childhood, you know, the context is really important, right? Like what the daycare environment is, what the teaching is like, what the home environment is, what the parenting is like, what the relationships are like at each point. And you're likely looking at a lot of environmental scaffolding of skills versus like individual work with a child unless it's like speech or something you know that's not totally social emotional and then someone might be doing one-on-one -on -one work so you're going to want to look for someone who's going to take time to talk to people in different settings take time to really understand I often when I'm working with families go and observe kids at school if I can because I get so much good information about a child from seeing them in a group setting um, you're also trying to kind of explain making sure with somebody who their explanation of what's going on and how their course of supports or treatments are going to help is really important. I see a lot of people who've been in maybe a certain therapy, like a sensory gym or play therapy for years, and they're, they're not sure what it's supposed to be doing and they haven't seen a change. So I think as a consumer, you should absolutely ask like, what's recommending, how will it help and how will I know, right? Um, Cause then you can make informed decisions based on like what that person is telling you. Um, and I also think about like, if you're on the fence about seeking services, there is no harm in taking your child to a mental health checkup, right? We take our kids to well child checkups every year. And that's just something we do as preventative care. And there's nothing wrong with saying like, I just want to see how their social emotional development is. Is there any scaffolding I can do? Um, so my center offers those types of services. I know we're like a minute left and there's some questions. So I don't know if you want me to pause and, and try to get to some of them in the chat. Yeah, for sure. So there's actually um, kind of a two-part question. I mm -hmm. see that somebody wrote in and they're wondering about why they're, uh, and how to kind of navigate this. So why their child care might have had a different opinion uh, about their child and be uh, maybe be concerned about being delayed when they went to their pre-K program, right? So the the child care until they were three had no concerns, very opposite opinion. The, ch the child now goes to pre-K and now all of a sudden there's concerns that they just weren't you know, aware of earlier around delays. And then the other part of that that might also be answered in your response is what happens if parents have different points of views on what the services should be, right? So your your co-parenting person is thinking uh, we should maybe wait and see, like you just mentioned, and another the other parent wants to go forward and, and seek services. Like how would you navigate, I guess, difference of opinions? Yeah, so I mean, I think for different settings, sometimes the difference in expectations can be big across different years, um, but sometimes it's also a difference in setting. And to really get more information about that, I think it's like an understanding of what exactly seeing, because right, like the difference between a threes program can be more play-based and pre-K can start to do more work. So sometimes that can bring out some more attention difficulties as there's increased demands on attention. Um, but sometimes it can do with the match between a teacher and a child. So here, when there's differences between settings, I'm always interested in like understanding why right? Like what's about one setting that's either accommodating a child's difficulty so you don't see it? Or what's it about a different setting that's maybe bringing out the best in a child? 
And how do we understand that based on the differences? And then kind of realistically think, well, what needs to be done next? With the co-parenting piece, I think it's really difficult. I think the most important piece is um, thinking about that parents want the best for their kids. And some parents are wanting to take a wait and see approach, not because they don't want the best, but because they may be nervous, anxious, they may be uncertain about services. And I think taking a step back to understand that and understand where they're coming from, what the concerns are, um, kind of what their thoughts are on their child's problem without kind of pushing your agenda, um, just really thinking about where they're coming from can be the mm -hmm. like first step in reducing that that kind of friction and that being stuck upon like one seeing something really differently. Um, I know great. we're pretty much out of time. I just want to make a plug for... Um, our team just did launch a social media for the Child Study Center that's focused on evidence-based parenting and child development info for um, zero to five. So if you're looking for more information and more like research supported parenting tips, feel free to check us out. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I do know we're out of time, but I'd love to just ask a few more questions that are oh, in the sure. chat box. Would you be able to do that? Um, that'd be great. Just a couple more. Um, so, and I just think they're really important. And again, I see myself in the, these parents right now. Um, yeah. a, you know, a toddler that is waking up from their naps really upset. Is there any advice that you have for this family? Yeah. So that's one, right? Where like, you know, when it happens, you know, what's going on. And some kids are like that, right? Like a little slower, groggy or more grumpy when they wake up. Right. So, you know, if they're getting an age appropriate amount of sleep, um, you can think about like, well, how do I make that gentler for them? How do I kind of make that a smoother landing? right? What are some environmental changes I could make, right? Like, do I, you know, kind of give them space to wake up on their own before I start getting them up and getting them ready for the next task, right? So like, how can I lessen that a little bit with some prevention strategies? Thank you. Um, another one is um, any tips specifically geared towards adjusting to a new sibling that's coming? Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> That is always really exciting. It's a loaded um, one. <laughs> you know, it's great to go from getting all the attention to sharing the attention with a little baby who needs a lot and the parents are more sleepy and sometimes less, a little less available, right? Because you're trying to divide between two different things. I mean, I think some good things to do here are books are great for little kids in terms of like explaining things, giving them pictures, um, explaining terms. And there's a whole host of books on being a big brother or being a big sister. Um, another great thing is the one-on-one -on -one time is really good because that protects time for the, for the child's feeling like I still get mommy and daddy's um, or my parents' full attention during this protected time. Um, depending on the age, giving them helper tasks can be also really good, right? So like, instead of having something to do, having them some, instead of something to don't where they're getting in trouble or getting jealous, trying to involve them in helping, whether that's getting a blanket, getting a, you know, probably not a bottle, but getting a diaper, getting things that like are little tasks they can do. Um, and then thinking about like, you know, also realizing that there's going to be some rocky moments there because that is a challenge. And that you can get through it and that you may see things more behaviorally. Your child may be more emotionally reactive. They may, if they're to just toilet trains, they may have bed wet a few times, right? Like you might see some shifts along the way um, and that's okay, right? Like that's part of the adjustment process or can be. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. So I want to thank you so much for doing this webinar with us. I'm, I, know, I know it's helpful. I'm sure it's helpful for all our participants. Um, we're going to be sending out this webinar to everybody who's registered. So all of Stephanie's team's contact information will be in there for you. I'm also including um, in our chat box my contact information. Should anybody have any outstanding questions, I will make sure to work with Stephanie and get you an answer. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It was such a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks for having me.